So good afternoon, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, again, we continue the session of uh, this morning uh, that we focus on innovation and creativity to foster entrepreneurships and economic development with Professor Jan van Svieten, rector of the Netherlands Business Academy, and now he's going to start um, a joint working group. Uh, we had in the program two working groups. He's going to do them together on leadership in progress and marketing purpose and, and limits. Uh, professor, the floor is yours. Okay, if you don't mind, we will finish a bit about leadership of this morning, which will give us enough input, I hope, for the workshops. Yes, is it uh, possible to switch? Miguel, can we switch to the presentation? Yeah. Okay. We will finish this first part. I hope you went well with your exercise because you will need it in the workshops. But we'll finish the first part by some things, some general things about leadership. So first, what is leadership all about? We saw earlier that leadership is about giving the sense. And that means that as a leader, we first must discuss what are our future objectives? What do we stand for? What is our vision? What is our mission? And this is always underestimated. Every organization I know is doing this kind of sessions. But it's more kind of technical thing and what is important about a vision and a mission? What we saw is that it is important to inspire people. People need to be inspired by the vision and the mission. They must recognize themselves in it and their personal sense must be aligned with this. And if you only do it as a technical exercise, it will not work. So every organization has strategic objectives, vision, mission, whatever, mostly very big documents. Does this really inspire people? Do the people that work on the floor have this in mind? Of course not. Even if we have a top management team, the first question we ask what is your vision? What is your mission? Do you know it? What is the answer I get normally? What are your strategic objectives? What will be the answer of the top managers of that organization? They will immediately say, oh, I have our message house in my desk. I will go get it. What does it mean? It's not in their head. And they will not act accordingly to it. So. We have a very famous amusement park in Holland. A lot of roller coasters, fairy tales, whatever. Great park. Elected best of Europe several times. And they also had their message house. Nobody knew it. So a new manager came in and he swiped it all off. And he had one new statement. He said to the people, imagine that you come into the park in the morning with your six-year-old son, nephew, neighbor, whatever. And all day long, you and the child will have a smile on the face. And what can you do to make that happen? What can you do? What can you do? What can you do? This is something people can work with. This is something they can do something with. So the vision and the mission may be in the cloud, but they are not abstract. The second thing is the sense, the why. Then come the simple things like procedures, the frame, the rules, the values. And then it's the simple work, knowledge, skills, competences. And as we saw, it's about the why, the how, and the what. 
Yes? So where are we going to? Why are we going there? How do we do it? And what needs to be done? Very simple concept. And who is taking care of what? The leader will be responsible for the inspiration, for the where and for the why. And sorry for the rest, this is tell. This is directive. No discussion. This is the way we are going. Why? Because it must be unanimous. We all must be united behind this. And I think Miguel was right when he said, OK, if you do not commit to this, then this is not your organization. <laughs> then we have the manager who is doing the rest. And this is ask. There, people have the freedom to bring their own ideas, their own way of working, whatever. Then they can see what are their values and what can they contribute to it. This brings us to the concept of the leadership and frame. So we have two things we have to market in the organization. The marketing of the frame and the marketing of the choice. If we look at the first one, the frame, no choice. So what is the marketing we have to do to bring the message to the people? This is the frame. If you want to play football, these are the lines of the pitch. And these are the rules of the game, period. No discussion. But how you make it, that's the choice. So you can do two things. You can start discussing the frame. But you will end up in endless discussions that will bring nothing. What should you discuss to empower people? That's where they have their choice, where they can bring their influence. So empowerment, stimulation, is on the second part. So if you look at Europe, we have the rules of Europe. OK, clear. This is what we all decided together. And this is the frame, non-negotiable. But within this, there's a lot of things we can discuss, a lot of things we can contribute by ourselves. And this is the marketing which is important. So if you look at it, we have the IQ tell and the EQ ask. And where does it very often go wrong? It's about the word fairness. What is fair? We had a group of people from Eastern Europe coming to Holland, end of the 90s. And we needed accommodation for these people. So we found some hostels where we could host them. And I asked to the people who organized it on their side, isn't this a problem? People will sleep with two or four people in one room. And then he said, no problem, no problem. This is normal, and they will not have a, a bathroom for themselves. No problem, he said. In our country, this is common, and it's even worse. So this is perfect. OK, they came, and they were very happy the first day. And then they saw how the others were located, and they were no longer so happy. And this is the fairness. And there's a study about it I would like to show you. Do we have sound, Alex? Do we have sound? Miguel? Do we have sound to the? No. 
So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study and there's now many more because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys. And I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs and with birds and with chimpanzees. Um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task, and we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us, and that's what she does, and she gets a grape, and she eats it. The other one sees that, she gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. <laughs> She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. <laughs> so. You see what fairness is doing. If you think that it is inequity, you will protest, although you were perfectly fine in the former situation. If we look at the concepts of leadership, then there has been many ways of looking at leadership through the years. And I think we cannot have a discussion about leadership if we do not go over it as soon as possible. So if you look at leadership, it all started with this manager thing we already discussed in 1870, and it was based on the operational skills. The second one was knowledge leadership. Guess what? It is based on knowledge, expertise. You're the best in what you do, so this is why people will follow you. The next one, around the 60s, is charismatic leadership. Oh, now it's different. Charismatic leadership is based on personal impact. And what is causing personal impact? Think of it for yourself. Think about people that inspire you, not with their knowledge, not with their ideas, but as a person. And then these aspects were in charismatic leadership. Surprisingly, all charismatic leaders are dominant. They are dominant persons. But somehow they get away with it because people still believe in them as a person. Charismatic leaders want to influence others, have a vision, and manage people to convince them with that mission. Yes, we can. They have a very good feeling, a very good sense in what people want to hear, what people want to know. They understand the sense, the SQ of other people, of the country, 
They're self-confident, take some risks, and they are quite true to their values. That's a charismatic leader. The next development in the 80s was servant leadership. All of a sudden, the leader was not just a leader, but it was based on the relationship. The leader was not there to tell the others what to do, but he was also a servant to the others. And actually, this was mostly in Collins' studies. And Collins developed the level five leader as the perfect leader. You have to keep in mind, and this is important for the studies of Collins, it was a real scientific study, let's say that, but only in the United States with the 100 best performing companies based on their results on the stock exchange. Yeah, these are the conditions. And then he says what was striking that all leaders of these companies were level five leaders. And that means personally modest, but professional with a very strong will. So they know how to set the course, but at the same time, it's not about them, it's about others. And another important thing for a level for a servant manager is that he is not afraid to have a strong team around him. He will choose the best people, and why? Because he's not afraid of these people as competition. And that is also very important. What we very often see is that people try to find people that say yes to them, that adore them, that will say, oh, you're my god. That's what most leaders do, not the servant leader, not the level five leader. We will try to find people that oppose him, that will bring new ideas, and he will use these ideas. So the next step, and it always corresponds with the changes in the time. In 95, the world changed quite rapidly, also with the crisis at that moment. And we started with the concept of situational leadership. And situational leadership, as it says, it's adaptive leadership. You have a different leadership style in every situation. You have a different leadership style according to the needs of the people. And this was mostly in the personal model of situational leadership. I don't know whether you know it. But if a person doesn't know anything, if there's a person here in the room who never played tennis and I take this person to the tennis court, can I immediately say, hey, just do your thing. Here's the racket, go play. Or do we need to tell this person, quite hierarchic, directive, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do that. So if the person is in development phase one, no knowledge, no skills, then I need a very directive, hierarchic way of leadership. If the person is very skilled, development phase four, I can delegate and let it go. I only have to be a mental support to this person. This is the concept of situational leadership. Yes? So, well. then in this century, we started developing quite fast. The next big step was authentic leadership. Many people believe in it, still believe in it. Authentic me leadership means that the leader is true to his own moral standards, his own values. He's not playing a role. He's saying exactly as it is. There's a lot of criticism on this idea. People find it great. People believe in it. But it is quite difficult. 
I mean, if you're in a company and you have to make profit because the shareholders want profit, are you going to tell your clients, hey, we are only here for the profit? Or are you going to tell your client, hey, clients first? Yeah? We are a client-oriented organization. Oh, but that costs money. So these two messages are contradictionary. So you're telling two stories. Are you still authentic? It's quite a difficult thing. But it was very good that ethics and moral values came back more and more after the big scandals we had. And especially in the financial sphere, we now have kind of a revival of authentic leadership more looking at moral values than anything else. So authentic means that you're honest, leading from the heart, strong backbone, don't go with every wind, you're brave, create communities, and you're open to feedback. Concept of authentic clear? Do you recognize yourself in it? Sometimes, that's a good answer. And the latest one, and that's really interesting, and this is why Steve's intervention in when he was sitting in the back of the room was quite interesting for me, because this is about shared leadership. The concept of shared leadership an open leader, open mind, open source, open space. Why shared leadership? And why in 2015 it started? It started with globalization. Is there any company of somehow bigger size that can survive only in its own surroundings? that can handle all projects just by itself and still be top. Actually, at that moment, we predicted the end of the multinationals. We said there is no one real big company which is flexible enough to go for the needs of the current questions, industries, whatever. So what started was a network of companies which was changing all the time needed for a project. And for every project, you needed other partners to do it with. We are here with five partners to bring you one course. So it's shared leadership. We have five leaders, and these five leaders have to communicate to each other. If one of them would be too dominant or try to rule over the others, it would be a mess the other four would fight it. So this is the concept of shared leadership. Now look at Europe. What kind of a network is Europe? A network of nations. It's not a nation itself, it's a network of nations with a lot of leaders. And if some leaders try to rule over the others, the others will oppose it. The people in that nation will oppose it. So shared leadership, I think, is very much applicable to the situation we also have now. If you go for this, it's about joint accountability with situational responsibility. And this is exactly what Europe is trying to do. So looking at the axis, you see, in the beginning, it was more IQ-based, knowledge, skills. Then it moved up. I think the modern technology wants more. Then we went up to EQ, the social component, trying to influence people. And nowadays, it's about all access as well as the managers are now bridges. They need to have all aspects in them. And this is also what we expect from people in the companies. So the XQ means all four of them. And then you can see how effective you are as a manager. 
Leadership is shown best when you're not there. If you look at my organizations, this week is interesting. I'm a, for one week, I'm not there. How will they act? Will it continue as if I wasn't there? If, if I was there? Or does it stop and they just wait and do nothing? Quite interesting. So this is development of ways how you can lead. Any questions on this? Well, then this is for now the end. In the afternoon, we will go a little bit further on this to teams and what does it bring for teams and does, how does this correlate to leadership and what can we do to see what it is to culture. So these are the topics for this afternoon. Now we go to the workshops. Yeah? You're intervening? Yeah, okay. That is leadership. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Jan. Maybe you have some questions before we go to the workshops? No? In the workshops, it will come. The, okay. So, because we are going to make it very interactive right now, so so let's go for the workshops and um, we can cut here the, the recording. And, uh, and then, if I understood you right, you want to divide it in three groups. So, we will have to move a little bit and uh, we have to move the chairs and uh, try to organize another club, they told me. But they already did it before, so well. 